Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, The Path to the Federal Bench, a conversation on federal judicial selection. My name is David Lyle and I'm the Deputy Director of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. The American Constitution Society is a network of lawyers, academics, policymakers, law students, and judges that promotes the vitality of the U.S. Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. As you likely know, much attention is currently being paid to the slow pace of judicial confirmations. And one place to look for an explanation is the creation of a nominee pipeline. Unfortunately, how qualified individuals are selected for the federal bench remains, to a large degree, shrouded in mystery. Today's program seeks to illuminate that process by bringing together those who have had direct experience with federal judicial selection, students of the vetting committee set up by senators to review potential nominees, and others interested in a more transparent and effective process. Of course, underlying the conversation is the sense shared by many that the process has become overly politicized, and we hope to hear our panelists' thoughts on that subject today as well. To start us off, it's my pleasure to introduce today's, the moderator of today's program, Carrie Johnson. As NPR's justice correspondent, Carrie covers the Justice Department for NPR. She's worked at the Washington Post from 2000 to 2010, where she won awards from the Society for Professional Journalists and the Society of American Business Editors and Writing, Writers, and has been a finalist for the Loeb Award for Financial Journalism and the Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News for Team Coverage of the, Mar of the Massacre at Fort Hood, Texas. Please join me in welcoming Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us today um, in this crisp fall afternoon. It seems to me this program couldn't be more timely. Um, not sure how many of you are following uh, the back and forth on the Hill this week, but uh, Judge Abner Mikva and Judge Tim Lewis this morning issued what amounts to a call to arms for the Senate to pick up the pace in terms of judicial confirmations in an article in Politico. Uh, that came right on the heels of a letter uh, by judges on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, including uh, Judge Alex Kaczynski, asking the Senate to hurry up and confirm people for many of the vacancies on that circuit. And at the same time, there's been a counter push um, by people like Kurt Levy at the Committee for Justice, who are arguing that the Senate should not do any action on judicial confirmations during this lame duck period. So lots of things to talk about in terms of how judges are selected and uh, the pace at which uh, they're reported through the Senate and, and voted on. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with a distinguished panel today. I'm going to introduce each of the panelists. Then uh, they're going to give us a brief overview, five to seven minutes. Uh, of, um, of their take on this situation. Then we're going to do some questions, and we'll leave plenty of time, maybe a half hour or more, for your Q&A at the end. So please do think about what questions you have for all of us um, moving forward. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce, on my far right, Rachel Brand, who's counsel at the law firm Wilmer Hale. Uh, Rachel works in the regulatory and government affairs practice and also the litigation department. Um, she helps clients with public policy counseling, crisis management, congressional investigation, Investigations and regulatory litigation. And my bet is she's about to get busier as uh, we, we start the new Congress next year. Uh, prior to joining the law firm, Ms. Brand was Assistant er Attorney General for Legal Policy at the Justice Department. That means she served as the Chief Policy Advisor to the Attorney General. And she also managed the Justice Department's role in the selection and confirmation of federal judges at all levels. She also prepared Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito for their confirmation hearings, which no doubt was an interesting window on history. From 2001 to 2002, Rachel was Associate Counsel to the President at the White House, where she gave a lot of legal and constitutional advice. Uh, welcome, Rachel Brand. And, um, to my close in right, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bill Robinson, who's president-elect of the American Bar Association. Bill's a member in charge of the Northern Kentucky offices of Frost Brown Todd. That's a regional law firm with offices in Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Indiana. He'll become ABA president for a one-year term in August 2011. 
Bill's been an ABA member since 1972, and he's been active for more than 25 years in various leadership roles. He's a past president of the Kentucky Bar Association, a past president of the Kentucky Bar Foundation, and a graduate of Thomas More College and the University of Kentucky College of Law, where he's been inducted into the Alumni Hall of Fame. Thanks, Bill. And to my left is Russell Wheeler of the Brookings Institution. Uh, Russell Wheeler is president of the Governance Institute, which is a small think tank with interest in relationships among the government. He's a visiting fellow in Brookings Governance Studies Program. And from 1991 to 2005, he was deputy director of the Federal Judicial Center. That, as you probably know, is the U.S. federal court system's research and continuing education agency. So Russell has a real window into how judges work. He's an adjunct professor at American University's Washington College of Law on federal judicial, oh, excuse me, on Washington College of Law, and he also serves on the Academic Advisory Committee at the ABA's Standing Committee on Federal Judicial Improvements. Uh, Rus Russell um, writes widely and publishes widely on issues regarding judicial selection, judicial ethics, and immigration courts as well, and he's going to give us a preview um, uh, or a survey of one of his most recent uh, research projects in just a few moments. Thank you, Russell. And finally, to my far left is Robert Rabin. Robert Rabin is president and founder of the Rabin Group. Um, he considers himself aggressively bipartisan, and he's worked on the Hill, uh, including for Congressman Barney Frank of Massachusetts. He advised um, uh, on many issues related to law and policy, civil rights policy, and politics. And uh, Robert Rabin also was endorsed by uh, former Chairman Henry Hyde, uh, a Republican from Illinois on the House Judiciary Committee, uh, for his appointment to the Justice Department in the Clinton years. Uh, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General and later Assistant Attorney General. He was confirmed unanimously by the Senate, um, something many of the judges we're talking about today wish, wish they could be. And he was charged at that time with overseeing Attorney General Janet Reno's legislative initiatives in handling a lot of congressional oversight of the Justice Department. Robert Rabin is past president of the Hispanic Bar Association of D.C., and he heads the organization's Judicial Endorsements Committee. He's also on the board of ACS and the Alliance for Justice. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists. Um, we are going to start out, uh, first of all, with Russell Wheeler of the Brookings Institution, who's going to tell us a little bit about his um, most recent research into uh, some of these issues. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my, my job today, I think, is to set the stage in terms of some basic data about where the nomination and confirmation process stands. Um, and, in, and I'm happy to do that. I'm not going to do a data dump, but I'm not going to do too much interpretation either. I used to go up to the Judicial Conference when I was at the Judicial Center, and the legislators would come first and address the conference. And first would be the Republican legislators depicting themselves as these models of bipartisanship and the, all the nominations they process, and the Democrats as obstructionists. And then the Democrats would get up and describe themselves the same way and, and criticize the Republicans. And I figured somebody visiting that from a foreign country would say, well, you never told me you had two Senates, because that's the only way you can reconcile the different <laughs> figures. So let me try to present some common sense, but also some consistent metrics. Um, we hear a lot, for example, people say the, the Senate has confirmed fewer, Bush nom fewer Obama nominees than it did Bush nominees at this time, which is true, but it doesn't take account of the fact that there are fewer nominees to confirm. And it also oftentimes conflates district and circuit nominees, and those are really two different, two different stories. So <clears throat> I, I think this, this sums it up, though. Um, just consider this. <clears throat> At the end of their first two years, for, for both President Clinton and for President Bush, the number of district vacancies dropped about 60 percent from 2001 to 2002, from 1993 to 1994. Number of circuit vacancies stayed about the same. At this point in Obama's first two years, the number of district vacancies has doubled, and the circuit vacancies have gone from 13 to 20. So you say, well, why is that? Well, some of it's uh, due just to the perhaps some variations in the rate at which judges take senior status or otherwise leave the bench and create vacancies. But it seems to me the more significant figures are this. O o President Obama has simply made many fewer nominations than did President Bush. 65 district nominees compared to 98. 
71 if you include the six who were nominated yesterday, but they were surely with no intention that they'd get confirmed. So 65 versus 98, 24 circuit compared to 31. So that explains part of the reason that this vacancy rate has gone up. Uh, there are just not as many nominees there to, to be confirmed. The other thing is this, though. The Senate's confirmation rate for district nominees for Obama is much lower than it was for Bush's. Um, the Senate confirmed 72 of uh, – uh, confirmed uh, about 85 percent of Bush's nominees in the 107th Congress. To date, it's confirmed 46 of Obama's nominees. Of nominees made before July 1st, uh, the Senate confirmed almost all Bush district nominees. And um, for Obama, the figure is around 55 percent. Now, it's true that in the lame duck session of Congress in 2004, the Senate confirmed 17 district no Bush nominees. Now, I guess it's theoretically possible for the Senate to confirm some more Obama nominees in the lame duck, but I certainly wouldn't hold my breath to, to see that happen. Um, if the Senate were to – just consider this, though. If the Senate were to confirm the 15 Obama nominees who have been reported out and the nine nominees who were supposed to be reported out this morning, but Denny Cardman tells me that's been pushed off for a week or so, uh, if they, the Senate were to do that – confirmed 24 district nominees, it would bring Obama's rate up to about where President Bush's was. Um, but it, if it can confirm only 30 district nominees in 22 months, it's not likely to confirm 24 more in a couple of weeks. So that's the big story, it seems to me, is this virus, which has infected the circuit nomination process, at least since President Clinton and persisted under President Bush, is seeping down to the district courts now, um, unless we see a, a, a real reversal. Um, now, Obama's confirmation rate for circuit judges is about the same as Bush's. Actually, percentage-wise, it's a little better, but not enough to make any difference. Uh, around 45, 46 percent. Uh, and obviously, if the Senate confirms any of Obama's circuit nominees that are pending, that, that figure will go up. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath. Now, um, just a few other f quick facts, just, just, just to cut through a lot of the, the talk we hear. Uh, the time from vacancy to nomination really hasn't varied much between Clinton, Bush, and Obama for, di for si district and circuit judges, except that for Bush's uh, appellate nominees in 2000, uh, 2001, he was out of the box really quickly, uh, getting those an average of about 140 days. Uh, the rate of hearings has been roughly the same throughout this period, except uh, that uh, Bush's circuit nominees got s significantly fewer hearings percentage-wise than had, had the others. Time to hearing was about the same, uh, once you account for the fact that the ABA was evaluating candidates at different times in the process for Clinton and Obama versus Bush. And um, uh, Obama's circuit nominees got confirmed uh, – uh, who got confirmed – waited longer after their hearings to get confirmed, but Bush's uh, nominees, circuit nominees who got confirmed waited longer for their hearings. And the other thing is this. Bush, uh, Clinton, and more so Bush, got in the practice of renominating people who didn't get confirmed in one Congress. The fact of the matter is that 95 uh, percent of Clinton's district nominees eventually got confirmed, as 100 percent of his circuit nominees did. Bush's figures went up as well. Uh, 81 percent of his circuit nominees eventually got confirmed, and we know the story that he renominated uh, the folks in the Sixth Circuit, for example, Patricia Owen and others. Now, whether Obama is going to renominate a lot of folks uh, who, uh, who aren't going to get through this time, that that just remains to be seen. Uh, I have some information on on race and ethnicity of these of these uh, uh, comparative race and ethnicity data, which I can go into if you want. But just in the interest of time, let me let me quickly shift to this other topic, this topic of these vetting committees that are now operating in 21 states. And in interest of full disclosure, I was on the ABA task force that President Wells appointed to draft the report and recommendation that in, endorsed these vetting committees that the ABA has the delegates approved in August. I, I continue to think that they can serve uh, a, a valuable um, – play a valuable role. But I have to tell you, the numbers so far make it – make it difficult to say that they've been an uh, uh, unbridled success. These committees have been created in 21 by, by legislators in 21 states, mostly by senators and a few by members of the House. And uh, the argument in favor of them is, is A, that they might 
uh, produce a more diverse set of candidates. Uh, people who, who don't have the political clout to go straight to a senator might apply to a committee. And also that if the nominees have the bipartisan support of a, of a committee, they might go through the process a little quicker. Well, it's really hard to say whether that's true or not. And it's confounded by the fact that we, we know who gets nominated from a state with a committee, like California, for example. And we don't know whether or not that nominee actually was recommended by the committee. So that limits our knowledge. And also some of these differences, especially in background that I'm going to mention real quickly, they may be just due to longstanding recruitment patterns in the state. But, but here goes. In terms of the committee states, nominees from the committee states, there is a difference. 26% are white males. From the non-committee states, 44% were white males. The percentage of women is about the same, but the percentage of other uh, ethnic minorities, especially Asian Americans, is much higher from the 21 committee states. But the biggest committee state is California. So you have to ask yourself, uh, the increased number of Asian Americans that Obama has nominated, is that due to the committee or is that due to the fact that California is California? You might expect that anyway. Um, in the committee states, 41% uh, are judges, state judges and term-limited federal judges versus 22% from non-committee states. That may bear out the view that a judge is more likely, a sitting judge is more likely to go to a committee to seek uh, a judgeship than go straight to the senator. Um, but, you know, who knows? Um, and on the average, this is interesting, on the average, the nominees from the committee states have a slightly lower average ABA rating than those from the non-committee states. Um, it's not much. If, if one is a humanitarily well qualified, the committee state folks have a 1.6 ABA rating. The non-committee state folks have a, basically a 1.2 committee state rating. And the committee state judges aren't getting confirmed as fast. In fact, their confirmation rate is about half that for those uh, judges who are nominated from non-committee states. So we don't know how this is going to all play out, but um, it, suffice it to say now there's not an ipso facto case that these committees make a big difference. Sorry if I went over. No worries. Um, now we're going to hear from Bill Robinson of the ABA, talking a little bit about the ABA's role in judicial selection in some of these committees, perhaps. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be here with so many friends who share the goal of promoting the vitality of our courts, our Constitution, and the fundamental values they express. The judiciary and the concept of separation of powers are under assault. If you think otherwise, consider what happened in Iowa this past Election Day when three state Supreme Court justices were unseated in retaliation for a politically controversial ruling. The leader of the campaign to unseat the justices said the vote will send a message to judges across the country that power resides with the people. But of course, it is the people who are under assault if our access to fair and impartial courts is denied. I would think that most of us in this room also share mounting concern over the persistently high number of judicial vacancies on our federal district courts and courts of appeals that is undermining the vitality and independence of the federal judiciary. So at rest with us, groups like the ABA, the American Constitution Society, uh, and other groups represented here today, to constantly remind fellow Americans of the time-tested ideals incorporated in the Constitution and to challenge society to live by those cherished values. We applaud you for having this event today and for your efforts around the country to promote the Constitution and the rule of law. In my few minutes of time today, let me explain why the ABA has adopted policy urging pre-nomination consultation and why we think that bipartisan screening commissions, while not a panacea, can reduce partisan rancor and accelerate the process of judicial appointments. I would also like to briefly outline the ABA's role in the advisory process for federal judicial nominations. As many of you know, the ABA has a long and sustained history of supporting the merit selection of judges at both the federal and state levels. For the federal judiciary, our history actually goes back more than half a century to the Eisenhower administration, which requested that the ABA help vet potential judicial candidates. 
nominees, I'm sorry, excuse me. In 1977, we supported the establishment by executive order of federal nominating commissions to suggest nominees for the courts of appeal. More than 30 years later in 2008, the ABA adopted a policy that urges pre-nomination consultation between the president and home state senators and the use of bipartisan advisory nominating commissions designed to minimize partisanship in judicial selection and enhance the judiciary's history of fair and impartial decision making. What we adopted is, it, it, when, when we adopted this policy, senators from eight states at that time used some form of a commission. There are now, as was just mentioned, 21 commission type formations. We would like to think that this increase is at least in part attributable to the ABA's policy. Our recommendations do not detail any criteria for membership on these advisory panels other than to say that they should include both lawyers and other non-lawyer leaders from throughout the community. In doing so, we hope that the composition of these panels shows respect for the diversity of the community at large. The makeup of the panels, as well as the factors employed by individual committees to reach their recommendations, would rest, of course, with the discretion of the senators. Our policy respects the constitutional prerogatives of the Senate. We simply seek to have senators guided rather than bound by their committee's recommendations. We believe that this approach should result in an even broader selection field and reduce partisanship, at least to some extent, in the remaining part of the process. Our recommendations respect the constitutionally vested prerogatives and duties of the President and of the Senate. We acknowledge that our recommendations cannot and should not eradicate policies, politics rather, from the process. Rather, they are meant to prevent politics from dominating and overtaking the process, as has too often been the case in more recent years. We fear that politics is now playing too significant a role and has contributed to the continuing delays in the confirmation process. Up to today, there were 23 nominations pending before the full Senate for district or circuit court judgeships, and 17 of them had no votes, had no votes of recorded dissent in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and yet they still not have been voted upon on the Senate floor. We are pleased to see that the Judiciary Committee is continuing to move others through the pipeline. Yesterday, as was mentioned, the committee held a hearing on several district court nominees, and this morning the committee was scheduled to vote on 11 of them, but Republicans requested that they be held over for another week. Responsibility for the high number of vacancies does not rest with the Senate alone. The Obama administration has been slow to make nominations as well, Right now, there are only 54 nominations for 106 vacancies on the federal bench. When delays of this magnitude occur, those who really suffer are the people, constituents of the senators. The risk is that the public will lose confidence not only in the justice system, but also in Congress's ability to support it. Let me address one other aspect of significance to this discussion as we engage in this conversation on the federal judicial selection process. As most of you know, President Obama invited the ABA back into the pre-nomination process in early 2009 after President, Bush departed, after President Bush departed from that practice which had begun back in 1953, as I mentioned earlier, during President Eisenhower's first year in office and continued with every administration since. The 15-member ABA Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary makes a unique and valuable contribution to the vetting process by conducting an extensive, confidential peer review of each potential nominee's professional competence, integrity, and judicial temperament, and only those three professional qualifications. That work complements rather than duplicates the efforts of the senator-level advisory commissions. Together, 
These efforts should generate diverse and qualified candidates for the federal judiciary and cultivate a process that is dominated by common purpose and a spirit of mutual respect and bipartisan cooperation. Our judicial system is predicated on the principles that each case deserves to be evaluated on its merits, that justice must be dispensed even-handedly, and that justice delayed is justice denied. All of these principles depend on a qualified, fully staffed federal judiciary. Thank you again for inviting me and the ABA to participate, uh, and I do look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Now we'll hear from Rachel Brand about the way this process worked when she was in the government. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um, it's great to be here at the ACS. Um, can't tell if my microphone is on. Um, I, I've done a couple of other events here, and ironically, I came from the Federalist Society annual uh, National Lawyers Conference to come here, and I'm going right back there afterwards, but I'm happy to, to be here with you guys today. Um, the organizers asked me to give the Republican way that this works, uh, the Republican perspective, but having thought about it, I can't say that there is a Republican versus a Democratic way that the process works. Each president has a particular type of judge that he's looking for in terms of qualifications in judicial philosophy. But in terms of the way the process works, every president faces basically the same political realities, which uh, limit the president's discretion in nominating the types of people that he would like to nominate. Um, there's a lot to say, and I only have five minutes, so I'm going to focus on one aspect of the process. There's been a lot of talk here about delay uh, in the nomination part of the process as opposed to the confirmation part of the process. So a president's success in judicial selection depends in large part on the speed with which he can make nominations. President Bush uh, made a really strong start. He nominated, I don't remember the details anymore, even though I was there, it was like 11 nominees in April or May of his first year in office. Um, and that was viewed as very aggressive at that time. President Obama, I was very impressed, he came out with his first judicial nomination even earlier than President Bush's first nomination. But after that, his pace of nomination slowed very dramatically, um, which has to be at least part of the reason for his lower confirmation numbers. So I wanted to give a little bit of perspective on what types of things can slow the process in the White House before nomination. There are lots of things that can slow it down, including competing priorities of the president. If it's 9-11 or if there's some other big thing going on, that necessarily is going to delay the pace of nominations. But one uh, factor that, that does delay it in particular is the consultation with the Senate that, that you alluded to. Um, you all know about the blue slip, which effectively gives home state senators a veto over judicial nominations made to seats in their state. So to avoid having a blue slip problem, presidents consult with senators before nomination is made. So a lot of people in the public don't realize that senators' views are actually as important, really, uh, to who is nominated in the first place as they are to whether that person is confirmed ultimately. Um, the thing that delays uh, nominations is that every case is totally idiosyncratic. It depends on what state it's in, it depends on which court in the state it's on, it depends on who the senators are, which party they're from, whether either of the senators is from the president's party, uh, who vacated the judgeship, there are all kinds of different things that go into it. Um, and the White House has to take all of those things into account when deciding whom to nominate. Um, there are some general principles that apply, one of which is that generally there's more deference to the senator's views for district court nominations than for circuit court nominations. Many senators have, have historically viewed district court nominations as theirs to pick. Um, in the Bush White House, we tried to push back on that a little bit by asking senators to give us slates of three names um, instead of just giving the president one name and saying, nominate this person. Um, most senators did comply with that request, and so we would then interview those people um, and you know pick which person we thought was the best. But there were some uh, occasions where a, a senator would just give the White House one name and say, this is the person we want, you know, end of the story. And then if that person is somebody who is objectionable to the White House for one reason or another, that's when the delay comes in. That can, that can result in a stalemate between the White House and the senator, um, which, if not resolved, can delay the nomination for months or even years in some cases. When it came to circuit nominations, we, um, we sort of viewed 
there to be less deference to, to senators' views. And so we would still obviously take names from senators, but we felt freer to go out and do some research of our own about who was qualified in the state for, the, for that particular judgeship. But because there is still a blue slip prerogative for circuit court seats, just there, as there is for district court seats, you have to consult with the senator before the nomination is made. And so, you know, we can go out and find some brilliant law professor at a law school in the state, but if we go to the center with that name and that person is objectionable, then there you are. Then you have to figure out, you know, where the balance is between insisting upon the nominee whom you like and nominating somebody who can be confirmed. And so there's that negotiation, that kind of back and forth in every single case that happens pre-nomination. And like I said, that can really delay things in certain cases. Um, let's see here. Um, I was going to say something about the, the judicial commissions. We, in the Bush White House, our sort of unwritten rule was that we, we didn't think we needed to be bound by the recommendations of the commissions, particularly when it came to circuit court um, nominations. But again, every case is idiosyncratic. And so a good example is Wisconsin, which um, at that time had two Democratic senators, both of whom were on the Judiciary Committee. That was, Wisconsin was the only state where that was true. Well, when you have two senators on the Judiciary Committee and they're both Democrats, what are you gonna do, right? So we, we essentially agreed to and did nominate people that were recommended to the senators by the Wisconsin Judicial Selection Commission, which consisted of uh, you know the dean of one of the law schools and the president of the state bar and, and some other people. And, and it worked okay. I mean, there were other, other ways of managing the process in other states with two Democratic senators. In New York, for example, uh, an agreement was reached with Senator Schumer where he basically picked one out of every four nominees. And there was a, an agreement that the president would nominate the person he picked for the fourth seat, and he would support Bush's nominees for the other three seats as long as they weren't very objectionable to either Bush or Schumer. And it, you know, it worked fine, actually. So you know, there are ways that the White House can use to facilitate the process, move the process, speed the process. But that back and forth with the Senate does really um, slow things down sometimes. I'll just stop there and take Thank questions. You. Thank you. Um, and our final panelist, Robert Rabin, uh, may want to talk a little about his time in the Clinton Justice Department and what he sees now in terms of diversity and possible uh, pace issues in the Senate. Thanks. Actually, I was prepared to do that, but I'm going to yield all my time back to her. I agree with everything she said. She said it more elegantly than I would. <laughs> that was it. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm particularly impressed that she started by saying so much of this is bipartisan or nonpartisan. Uh, it's a structural issue, uh, much more than a partisan issue. It's actually a little lamentable to me how much time is wasted among partisans spending time accumulating data trying to prove that the other is worse than we, um, when, when I think the whole, the whole system is deeply, deeply problematic. Um, I made a top ten list of why why it feels so slow. Um, it feels so slow because it is so slow. And in no particular order, um, the, you know, the most important thing for why nominations feel weird to the nominee, to people watching, to the American public, it's not a meritocracy. Um, w why you're selected and who ultimately gets confirmed doesn't have a objective uh, indicia to it such that one could predict that they're the smartest, fastest, cutest, anything. It is not a meritocracy. There are thousands and thousands of people qualified to be a federal judge. Who makes it from point A to point uh, B through the confirmation process is, is, is a set of inscrutable variables. Um, Administrations come in with a set of values. Frequently, it's a set of new people who've not done it before. They have to set up shop. They have to do it quickly. There's a lot of interest group pressure. This is nonpartisan. Um, and each administration comes in with, we're looking for this kind of person. And they quickly run up against a Congress, which is much more established and less nimble about a new kind of person. And I think Rachel intimated it when she said, well, we want this in Wisconsin. And we ended up with a law school dean and the head of the bar. A very establishment pick. No, no, no. That's not who was nominated. That's who was on the commission to pick the nominees. Sorry. So anyway, I, yeah. I, I heard what I wanted to hear, <laughs> as I as I always do. Um, uh, what this administration was interested in was the completely diverse, the law, the sole practitioner, and and this public interest lawyer. And you run up against a system of sitting senators who, well, that's interesting. But no, I was actually looking at the managing partner, Manat Phelps. That frequently happens. 
Um, she called it idiosyncratic. I say that each state is sui generis, each senator is sui generis. It's a set of relationships and horse trading that has to go on between the White House Counsel's Office, Ledge Affairs at the White House, and the senator. Um, on the on the progressive side, on left of center, I think there are many more interest groups and constituencies involved in the question of who's an acceptable judge than on the right. I say glibly, and I know unfairly, on the right, if you're okay with the Chamber of Commerce and we can infer that you're pro-life, you're likely acceptable. Left of center, it's really a tremendous, tremendous amount of public policy issues that interest groups want to run you through as a potential candidate to see whether you're okay. And at some point, it feels like there are peremptory challenges that different groups try to ascribe to different potential nominees. And so it's complicated for the White House Counsel's Office, left of center, to deal with so many uh, constituencies. An interesting thing that happens on left of center, on the Democratic side, uh, there are many more minorities. There are minority interest groups, and I have observed, I chair the HNVA's endorsements committee, minority bars and minority groups. Minority bars are nonpartisan. Uh, some of them feel like they skew to the left, but they're nonpartisan. Um, minority bars provide a great number of candidates. They're not all progressives. They're minorities. That doesn't mean they're progressive. And so progressive groups, which are interested in diversity, we frequently have this interesting clash over particular nominees. Clash is a euphemism. We have brawls over particular nominees, which really slows the process down for the White House and the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm being a little oblique here. Um, there's a literal problem of senators not providing names. There is this presumption that the White House counsel will defer to them, particularly on the district courts, and some senators just, just take a long time. There's the blue slip issue. Vetting has become more complicated. Uh, the internet has allowed a great number of people to be involved in ferreting out what candidates are like, and that video that you forgot about, uh, or you had no idea it was being taped, of your speech at the Hemlock Society in Tucson, um, <laughs> pops up after you've filled out your questionnaire. So not only do you have the subject matter of that uh, video of the Hemlock Society in Tucson, but you lied to the Senate. You didn't include that video that you didn't know was a video. Um, and that has happened to a number of our candidates. Uh, obstruction. Uh, it's not related to judges, uh, but we have increasing tools for members of the Senate to block each other's initiatives, and the horse trading has become more complicated, and the judiciary is not immune to that larger political fact. Um, and then on pure politics, the Democratic senators can't really point to a serious voting constituency that actually is moved by judges. I've said that as diplomatically as possible, uh, but in assuming everybody is of good and fair mind and they're interested in a sound Article Three and they want qualified candidates and they care about the judiciary, arguendo, you now get to politics and votes matter and we have uh, been um, inadequate on the Democratic side of the aisle of creating a political constituency, either votes or, regrettably, as long as we have a privately financed campaign system, which is disgusting, money. <laughs> so we have neither votes nor money around judges in any significant way, and so very few Democratic senators walk around thinking it's a political winner. And so what Democratic senators tend to focus on is particular candidacies in their state about which they care, but there isn't this coherent mass of political effort on the Democratic side saying judges matter. Um, and I, I actually did create an 11th. Um, this administration had two Supreme Court nominees, um, which is its own, own feat, but as a literal matter, uh, it's, there's an opportunity cost to that kind of effort. The very small number of talented, hardworking people in the White House Counsel's Office and the political affairs shop, uh, legislative affairs shop at the White House, divert all of their attention, all of their attention for up to a 10-week period on Inri the matter of Sonia Sotomayor, 
and the opportunity cost is there's this whole swath of that Idaho middle appeals court judge and that and that New York district court judge that get no attention for a 10-week period, and that happened two years in a row, and that has a great effect on the whole cohort. I'll stop there. Thank you. We're going to do a few questions talking amongst ourselves and then open up to the audience in, in just a little while. I wonder, uh, there seems to be a fair amount of agreement on this panel that uh, perhaps things are not working as smoothly as they should, but I think um, Russell pointed out there are now 54 pending nominations for 106 vacancies on the bench. Um, how, how does one pick up that pace given uh, the political reality for the White House Counsel's Office, some of the brawls Robert Rabin has so memorably outlined, and uh, the fact that the Senate is going to get uh, closer in terms of uh, composition rather than, uh, <laughs> rather than less so in a very small amount of time? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, you alluded to, and it's true, you have to look at this in the context of the Senate makeup. I mean, Bush, Bush got 46%, I said, of his circuit nominees confirmed under a Democratic Senate. That started going up in the next Senate because it was Republican. Now, you might say, this is the perplexing thing, you might say a president who, with all due respect, could have squeaked into office and had a Democratic majority, although slight in the Senate, would not do as well as a president who won fairly handily and had 60 and then 59 uh, votes in the Senate, but actually Obama's done worse. So I, I have a hard time figuring out what's going to undo it, tell you the truth, because it seems to me these, these, these Obama nominees, uh, they wait a long time, but once they get a vote, usually, not always, but usually they get a unanimous vote or a very strong vote. So I'm a little perplexed about what's going on, I must say. Others here are closer to the scene and may be able to answer that. One thing to, to consider is what else is going on in the Senate, because you know since the Democrats are in the majority, they control the schedule. But if there's a lot else on the schedule, I mean, if you're doing Obamacare and you're doing all these other big bills, you know, financial regulatory reform and everything else, necessarily other things get slowed down. So that's, that's true both in the pre-nomination stage when you might have a Supreme Court nomination, you might have other priorities of the White House um, sucking up all all of everybody's time, the same could be true in the Senate on the schedule. I'm not saying that accounts for every, all of it, but that's a factor to consider. Well, I'm, go ahead. Bill Robinson, you um, painted a picture of a judiciary potentially under assault and the notion that some of these vacancies may begin to undermine uh, citizens' access to justice. What is the ABA going to do about that? Well, we are increasingly focusing on the judiciary, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. And, and we are working hard to awaken the public at large on the reality that we, 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 don't, we do not have in this country enough appreciation for the significance of the judiciary in the rule of law, in the rights that we all would like to think that we can enjoy, but are meaningless if they cannot be enforced. Uh, we have in, inadequate funding of the judiciary at all levels, and what I just heard suggests that it may be with regard to the Senate that whatever the important issue of the day might be that attracts everyone's attention uh, and distracts away from the importance of the, the appointment of federal judges uh, may just be another reflection that there's, there's a decline in appreciation for civics uh, in this country, a decline in appreciation for the third branch of government, and therefore we'll get around to it, but it isn't a priority when it's up against so many of these other issues. That seems to be the pattern, and the pattern is becoming increasingly um, disappointing and a matter of, uh, should be a matter of, um, of more national concern. But who advocates for the judges? I mean, who goes around lobbying for the judges? The judges can't pitch for themselves. The judiciary has an impossible task in trying to promote itself, can't promote itself for various ethical considerations. So who's out there pitching? The American Bar Association is taking up the cause with increased focus and more intensity, and we intend to work harder and harder on this issue as a matter of both professional privilege and responsibility. Um, you're right. I mean, the, the, the judges don't have a lobby, especially on the question of nominations. They tend to stay away from that. But 
uh, we all recall back when Clinton was having a tough time with his nominees that Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, in one of his year-end reports, took the Senate Republicans to task. And he did the same thing to the Senate Democrats later. Now, that's one voice that can speak and can speak. I have no idea if he's going to or not. But Chief Justice Roberts, I think, could say something about this if he were a mind to. But I won't say anything more than that. The, the, go ahead. The, the, the President of the United States also has a, a voice. And um, Bush, I think, used it much more frequently to advocate on behalf of judicial nominations than, than Obama has. Well, I agree with that, Rachel. But, but I don't think that turned as many Democratic heads as the Chief Justice of the United States, who, who didn't have a, ideologically, you would think, probably wouldn't, if he had a choice, pick a lot of the Democratic nominees, but he spoke out in just the interest of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. the, the time and circumstances for Chief Justice Roberts may not be exactly the same as those um, that uh, Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist dealt with in, in his time. Uh, recall that, that within the last 36 months, Chief Justice Roberts came out very intensely about the need for increased judicial compensation uh, at, at the federal judiciary level uh, throughout the country, and it didn't get to first base. I mean, it never got off the runway in terms of getting any serious consideration. So the, the, the influence uh, that the Chief Justice has in a political uh, environment such as we are dealing with today uh, may not offer the same opportunities as were available to Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, during his time. I don't know, but I, but I wonder about that. Robert Rabin, two questions for you. One is, um, do you think that uh, Harry Reid and this Senate are going to take up votes on some of uh, the judges that have been sitting around in this lame duck session? And the second is, um, regarding diversity, do you think that this process of brawls and internet vetting and um, structural problems um, that you described is uh, leading some candidates to not want to throw their hand in the ring in the first place? Yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> I believe in quick panels. Uh, yes and yes. Yes, I believe that Harry Reid will do what he said he will do. He's doing it on a variety of things. He's doing it on the DREAM Act. He's doing it on, there was a series of promises right before uh, his election about what he would try to take up in the lame duck, and I think he will tick them off, and they may procedurally fail. Um, they may go through, uh, but I believe that he will bring up some judges, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think the the healthy response to the question about intimidating nominees. This is not, uh, and what you've all have been I think discussing about what it's like to be a judicial nominee. It's not unique to the judiciary. I think for some lawyers, it's it feels harsh and awful to have judicial candidates treated like this. But this is a plenary pr problem with all nominees. So the general counsel at the Department of Agriculture the assistant secretary for export promotion, I made that up, at Commerce. Uh, this is where we are, where uh, nominations uh, are no longer part of the same gentleman's club, and it's a much more sprawling <coughs> and complicated and difficult process. Does it intimidate people? It should. It's an awful, awful, awful exercise to have so many exceptional people willing to do what they call public service put through a process of tell me about your uh, ad on eHarmony. Did you ever meet anybody on eHarmony? Uh, does your spouse know that? So this is becoming um, uh, common that nominees not just for the judiciary, but throughout the government are put to, and this is again not partisan, I don't think that one party has a monopoly on this kind of behavior, but it's the culture in which we live, and it feels particularly coarse to people at the ABA that how dare we be treated like this, but it's certainly not unique to the judicial nominations. It's a sad fact of modern American congressional relations. Let me just add one thing to that, and that is um, the effect, as far as judicial nominations go, 
the effect on somebody from private practice is really seems to be quite different than the effect on a state judge who gets nominated because uh, a, a private practitioner is going to be less and less willing to have her name thrown in the ring for a district judgeship if it looks like the practice is going to be in in uh, limbo for a year. And unlike several years ago, chances of getting confirmed aren't as good as they used to be. And so we're likely to be getting, let me consider this. Under President Eisenhower, 67% of his district appointees came from the private practice of law. For Clinton and Bush, it was around 40%. For Obama, it's even less. Now, you can debate whether or not that's good or bad for the judiciary, um, but it's a fact, it seems to me, and the, the ugly confirmation politics are only going to, going to accelerate it, especially because a sitting judge is less likely to have had an ad on eHarmony for a host of reasons than perhaps somebody in private practice. So that trend is inevitable. Whether it's good or bad, people can debate, but it seems to me this confirmation mess is not making it any make, mean that the, 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 the prospect attractive at all to private practitioners. I can tell you for a fact that it during the Bush administration, there were people who declined to be considered for at all levels of the judiciary because they didn't want to go through the confirmation process. Because of the vetting or because of the likelihood that it would take a long time to be confirmed? I mean, mo both. I mean, there are, there are people who are concerned about their practice being in limbo, and there are people who just didn't want to deal with the life open book dragged through the mud for no good reason kind of thing. Bill Robinson, I, there have been some calls from the Wall Street Journal in some groups in the states associated with uh, manufacturers associations and possibly the Chamber of Commerce who seem to look askew at this issue of um, merit selection committees because they think lawyers should not be the only ones in charge of determining who are judges. Where is the ABA on that issue? Well, we don't think lawyers should be the only ones in charge either. Uh, and that's why we have strongly recommended that these commissions be made up not only of lawyers who bring a, an obvious expertise um, and the value of experience to the process, but we em emphasize that these commissions should also include leaders from throughout the community, that they should be diverse, that they should come from all walks of life. Uh, there's the role for the lawyers, but the lawyers should not dominate. So we're on the same page in that regard. And Robert Rabin, if I'm uh, correct, your firm actually does some lobbying work for uh, some judicial nominees. Or uh, do you think that's going to become more uh, common to have judges have lobbyists to get on the bench? No, <laughs> no. I actually, it's thank you for that. Uh, I don't have any paid relationship with any candidate to lobby for judges. I have declined that, and oddly, amazingly, not just judges, but nominees in the executive branch have offered to hire us to handle the effort. And I have declined that representation. Uh, I think it's bad for them. Uh, I won't say any more about me, but I think it's bad for them to pay me to do that. Uh, but it reveals what has become a modern, I won't say necessity, but close to it. It's this entirely political effort to get nominated and confirmed that has to look apolitical. And uh, it really is a fantastic art how an ambitious person, an adult desirous of public service that requires a, a confirmation or a nomination gets a political nod either from the White House or a senator, and then has to go into this mode of, as you see with Sotomayor and Kagan, of complete apolitical, never had a political thought. You know, that's an extreme example of it, but that's where we are uh, in the cycle. And so it takes people who have some experience, and folks at my firm, like Rachel, have a lot of experience in moving nominees through, um, responding to criticism, uh, doing a moot for a confirmation hearing so you know where to put your hands and not to twitch too much and not to say that's the stupidest <laughs> question I've ever heard in my life, but rather say thank, thank you, you, Senator, Senator. for that scurrilous, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that scurrilous condemnation of my character. I really appreciate you raising it. It's important that we talk about it if it's important to you. you know, so there's a whole lingua franca to the process and so we so in addition to what I said, I chair the HNBA's Endorsements Committee, but I run this whole informal campaign 
to identify openly gay uh, professionals around the nation who were qualified to serve and help the White House vet them for positions throughout the executive branch that require confirmation and the judiciary. We've never had an openly gay judicial nominee uh, until recently. And that took work, and someone has to do that. That doesn't happen sua sponte, as you lawyers say. So we and folks at my firm are in the business of helping professionals who are interested in going through the process. What do you wear? What do you say? Who do you talk to? How do you get the FOP to support you? I, I you know, I smoked a lot of weed. What do I say? Blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> We're going to open up uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, fire away. Please identify yourself by name and organization. Uh, the gentleman in the back, in the middle. You, you sir. Uh, hi, my name is Oliver Sloman. I'm a student at Georgetown. I have two questions. The first is very quick, but is it at all possible that the slowdown in nominations is a response to the slow confirmations? As in, I've got a lot to do. You don't seem to be confirming these people. Why bother nominating them? Um, and the second one is, I feel like ACS's materials suggest that a big reason for the slowdown in confirmations is, is really simply because Republican senators don't want to confirm Democratic nominees. And yet, all of you seem to be downplaying, if not sort of saying that that's just absolutely not the case. So I was just wondering if people could comment on that as well. I, I don't. Um well, I'll, 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 I'll start, and I'll be real quick, and then others who know more can say it. Um, you could say that Obama says, well, why nominate them if they're just going to sit there? The other tactic is that we're going to get them all up there, and we're going to have a real low confirmation rate, and then we're going to run against the Republicans uh, for not confirming them. Uh, 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 Daschle lost his Senate seat in part because of accusations that he was just not processing Bush nominees fast enough. So I don't know if that's it or not. Um, as, as to the, the, the second part of the question was about you asked. Are the R's obstructing more than the D's? I can't think of any other good reason that, that so many of these district nominees are not getting votes other than the fact that they just don't want to approve them. Because most of them, are they have not excited the Democratic base. It's not as if they're a bunch of raging liberals that he's nominated. So I, I you know, by a process of elimination, that's where I get, but I could be could be wrong. Well, this is where we get into the battle of the numbers, which I absolutely hate and usually refuse to engage in because there is a statistic to support every proposition that you can possibly think of. There's a statistic to, purport to support what you say. There's another one to support that. There's really no difference between the way that ours are treating Obama's nominees and the way that D's treated Bush's nominees. I mean, it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, there are lots of reasons why the process might have slowed down. It could be competing priorities. It could be, you know, two Supreme Court nominees. It could be anything. Um, of course, the fact of the matter is there are 59 Democrats in the Senate, which is pretty remarkable. So you can't say that it's totally the Republicans' fault that people aren't getting confirmed. I mean, there has to be. Well, but then, but if you if you prioritize judges, then you can take the time on the floor. But my guess is that other priorities are more important to the. Majority I, leader, I, I don't know. But. I would say I don't think Republicans are, by their DNA, more obstructionist than Democrats on this issue. I think they're better at it. <laughs> they're more effective at it for a couple of reasons. For some of them, it's more passionate. And the Democratic opposition to their opposition isn't that strong. And it's not that strong for a couple reasons. Part of it is personality. Uh, the leadership on the Democratic side um, is busy. And Harry Reid, who is, I think, a fantastic leader and an excellent senator from the state of Nevada, is Harry Reid from the state of Nevada. He's pro-gun. He's not particularly pro-choice, which is an overstatement. You know, there's a series of public policy issues that he well represents his state on that are not particularly concordant with a big chunk of the Democratic caucus. And it plays out. It matters. There isn't a lot of passion for getting certain judges done because he had a very tough reelection campaign, and how can this possibly be a priority in the state of Nevada? Third, the thing I said earlier, we on the Democratic side don't have a constituency 
apart from race, that really rallies around this stuff. That so you just made an excellent point, Mr. Daschle, in part is attributed to losing his election because he was obstructionist on Bush judge. That's not possible on our side. We couldn't run a serious campaign and motivate voters, at least with the infrastructure we have now, except on race. I think if there was a clear showing that a Republican senator was blocking somebody based on race or ethnicity, maybe gender, we could run a political campaign about that. Mr. Ashcroft, when he was a senator, was alleged to have blocked a black state court Missouri judge from being elevated, and Democrats were effective at portraying his opposition in part due to race. Ashcroft, Senator Ashcroft, vehemently denied that. I, he may have said in one, in one point, I didn't know Ronnie White was black. But it was effective. The Democrats really ran that campaign. I was confirmed the next day unanimously, I believe, because the Republican leadership pulled four minority nominees that had been pending for some time and had us confirmed. I believe cause and effect. So the Democrats can run a political campaign that resonates with a voting constituency around a demographic. But basically, just we're mean, or they're mean, or values, or anti-choice, forget about it. There's no voting constituency that's really mobilized around that on our side. You know, one other thing that you alluded to in your opening is, is the sort of horse trading that can go on. I mean, if, you know, if the Democrats really wanted somebody confirmed, you, could, you can consider trading substantive legislation for confirmations, too. I mean, there are all kinds of tools you can use, and the question is just whether it's important enough and, you know whether you want to use the tools. More questions? Yes, ma'am. One second, sorry. Hi, I'm Cynthia Butler. I'm a lawyer. Um, a technical question about the, um, the process of, of vetoing. If you have a circuit court judge that sits in a number of states, you know, the Ninth Circuit covers a bunch of states and so does the third, and do each of the senators from each of the states that it covers get a veto in the circuit? And also, does anybody have statistics on, um, statistics on uh, the elevation of lower court judges to the circuit court as opposed to people who've never served in the judiciary in the circuit courts? On the first question, um, the answer is no. Each circuit court seat is considered to belong by a very Byzantine sort of process to belong to a particular state. So we all know that you know Judge Wilkinson's seat belongs to Virginia and so forth. I mean, it's, it's just known to be so. And in some cases, it's sort of lost in history how that seat came to be Alabama's seat instead of F Florida's seat or something like that. But, but it is known which seat belongs to which state. There are sometimes complications that arise. So for example, on the Ninth Circuit, Judge Trott, who's now senior, um, was nominated to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, he was in the Justice Department in DC. He was nominated to what was known to be a California seat on the, on the Ninth Circuit. But since there's no law that requires him to have his chambers in California, he moved to Idaho and sat in Idaho for his whole career. Then when he went senior, the Idaho senator said, that's an Idaho seat. And the California senator said, nah, -uh, that's a California seat. And which resulted in a stalemate that delayed, I don't think anyone has still been confirmed to no, that no. seat. It's been like six years now. And, and most of the delay there was a result of the disagreement about which state that seat belonged to. So it's, it's complicated. As to, as to the circuit judges elevated from the state bench, it's, it fluctuates around 50%. For the last three presidents, district judges and state judges is around 60%. It's not this steep decline, though, you see in the district courts in private practice. I'm Lane Green from The Economist magazine. Can you just give us a sense of what's, what the on-the-ground effects of these vacancies are? I know there are case backlogs. Can you give us a little more detail of the particular kinds of cases affected? Do you have any good examples of some case that's been on, the, been on the docket forever that hasn't been taken up? Just give us a sense of more what this is actually doing in terms of the dispensation of justice. Well, I, I, think it's, I think it's regional. The Eastern District of California has gone without, I mean, it's a fairly small district, but they have a per judge caseload of over 1,000, which is much higher than elsewhere. I think along the border courts in Texas also, those have been vacant because of fights between the senators and the members of Congress. And um, 
of course, that is a heavy immigration and drug caseload, so I'm sure there's an effect there. Small little district of Delaware, four judges, but an awful lot of commercial litigation there, and they've been down to two judges for quite some time. And um, that's created havoc there. I don't know if there's any national picture, but it's a, it's a good question to ask. The greater the volume, <clears throat> the greater the volume, the greater the delay, the greater the delay, the more pressure to process cases more quickly, and it doesn't take a lot of speculation to suspect that the quality of justice is stretched and, and potentially compromised because there just aren't enough hands on deck, and so the volume continues to grow. The Sixth Circuit had this situation for years when we couldn't get uh, nominees from Michigan approved, and it went on and on and on, and the Sixth Circuit just uh, almost came to a halt uh, at a given point in time because there weren't enough judges to decide the cases. Well, witnesses die, at least get older, memories fade, uh, cases do come back to be retried, and so on. Justice is compromised, so delay in, in the justice system is not a good thing. Backlog results in delay. And actually, Michigan is probably the best example I know of of delay that results from you know, two Democratic senators in a state and a Republican president, and the, the stalemate there, which was eventually the backlog was eliminated because of a deal, basically a deal between Senator Levin and, and Bush about who would get nominated, and Bush nominated one of Levin's picks, and there you go. Everyone got confirmed. It began under Clinton, actually. I mean, it was a problem that got inherited by that's, the Bush that's administration. Right, yeah. But the political problem of what they've just said is, it, it's my sense, working this, that no voter knows this or cares. And unt okay. until there's a voting constituency that believes that some aspect of fairness in their life will be improved, when people making 170, whatever they make now, when there are more of these people, you can't move senators in any serious way to do something about it. And it's really a sad fact. Well, and the ABA has standing to put some effort into educating adult Americans about this fact, but we have been terrible at it. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Leslie Pearl from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I have a question for Rachel. I um, monitored the Bush nominations for the uh, entire eight years, and I didn't always agree with your nominees, but I did have a great deal of respect for the way that the Bush administration pushed for their nominees and for the priority it gave to judicial nominations. And I appreciate what you said about the practical obstacles within the White House about um, nominations. I just wondered if you were advising this White House, you know, for charting a path for the next two years in terms of how to be strong and firm, um, what would you, what advice would you give them? <laughs> well, boy, I hesitate to presume to give advice when I don't know what they're dealing with on the inside of the White I don't know why the pace of nominations has been slower. I mean, I don't know if you know, there are all kinds of reasons one can speculate. The, the Supreme Court nominations is significant. I don't downplay that at all. Um, the, this White House experienced some hiccups with its vetting, some high-profile vetting issues, and my impression from the outside is they then really ramped up the vetting process. You, there's got to be some balance. I mean, there, there are all kinds of, so I don't know why the pace is slower, so it's hard to know what to say in terms of how to, how to fix that. Um, I mean, I think President Bush personally cared about judicial nominations. I'm sure President Obama does too, but, but Bush gave major speeches. He was out there. He, um, he used his stature as the president to really push the issue. What effect that had, I don't know, but it must have had some effect. So, I mean, there, there is, you know, I haven't seen Obama do that as much, so maybe that's part of the issue, but I, I, I guess I couldn't, I wouldn't want to presume to say what they need to do. The pace of nominations has picked up since the first of the year, and that's, They've been nominating at the pace of this year, last year. I don't think we'd have this complaint. The gentleman back there, please. Yeah, my name is Bill Weisenberg. I chair the ABA Standing Committee on Judicial Dependence. My question first is directed to Mr. Wheeler. You made an observation earlier on the impact on private practitioners. I'd like you to address the issue of sitting judges. Do you believe that the politicization of the process now and sitting there, a nomination sitting for extended period of time could have an influence on how a sitting judge might rule on a controversial case because of fear of that entering into 
the confirmation process. Recogn and, and I'll give you, let's talk, give you a concrete example. The three judges in Iowa. If, if any of those judges were pending before the United States Senate for, a for an appointment to the federal bench, knowing the situation we have today, would that impact how p judges decide cases? Because that really speaks to the foundation of a fair, independent, and impartial judiciary. Do those things enter the minds, in your mind, do you think, of candidates or nominees for the bench today? Well, I'll, I'll respond because you asked me, but I think others here are probably better, 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 better situated to answer it. I've, I've had district judges tell me that they knew when they issued a certain ruling that their chance of going on the Court of Appeals was gone. Now, I don't know whether or not they really had a chance or not. I think it's, uh, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, it, obviously, it would be crazy if it didn't think about it, but these three judges in Iowa, they must have known they were likely to get in a certain amount of problem. They knew the retention election was coming up. They knew it was a controversial issue, and they decided, along with all their colleagues, I might say, on the Supreme Court to decide as they would. So who knows? I, uh, Ian Milheiser with uh, Center for American Progress. So I, I want to push back a bit on some of the stuff that Rachel has said about um, floor time. Because the, the way that the Senate rules work is that the minority can force up to 30 hours of wasted time per nominee. Um, and in order to force that, and when you multiply that 30 hours times the thousand people that a president has to confirm, and that's not just judges, that's assistant secretaries, that's ambassadors and whoever else, it adds up to more time than there is in two presidential terms. Um, so the minority actually has the power to make it impossible to, um, to move nominees forward, um, except for maybe the handful that you could spend the 30 hours on. Um, the Senate does have a mechanism around that. It's called unanimous consent. And yet we have nominees who are passing 99 to zero, you know, or maybe 99 to dement, who are being, um, who, who are having to get the full 30 hours of time and get a cloture vote and get all of that delay done. So I, I guess what my question is, is now that this seal has been broken, you know, now that we're at the point where the minority has figured out that it has the power to essentially shut the Senate down, you, you know, I would be mad when there was a different president in office if, and if there was a Democratic majority, if that Democratic majority didn't you know, engage in the exact same tactics that we're seeing now, is there any way we can have a functioning judiciary without a Senate rules change? Well, it doesn't, a lot of this depends, I think, on what the relationships within the, the committee are. I mean, if you, I don't know, I, I hesitate to, to comment on that. I don't know, Robert, what do you think? You want me to throw my cap friend under the bus? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes, they're mean. They're very mean. They're mean people. They do mean things. <laughs> and us saying that is not a strategy. Uh, you know, call, call the question. Make them get up and talk for 30 hours. Make them do that three times in a row. Make them do it six times in a row. Make them bring cots in. I mean, there are things that it's an elaborate and wonderful system of checks and balances. And there's no question that it gets out of whack when people, quote, abuse a parliamentary tactic to gum up the works that we want done. Uh, I'd hate to be quick to eliminate some of those tactics because the Senate has done some vicious, tried to do some vicious things over the years to blacks and to gays and to women and to undocumenteds. And so these tactics uh, have their place. I, I know that was a long answer. I, I feel like, or not a long answer, but an incendiary answer. Uh, I feel like obstruction has gotten out of control across the board. I also feel like leadership that can push back on obstruction hasn't been as strong as it could be. And there may be some very good political reasons why they haven't used all the tactics they could use to do that. But that's the conversation. It's not to be mad at people for deploying tactics that are available to them under the rules, in my opinion. Sorry, this gentleman right there. Thank and, you. And, 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 Sorry, Robert. And for, and for every dement, there's a Ben Nelson. That's a, that's a happy thought. Well, it's a fact. And the other, and the other party has it, used to have it too, although, although now they're down to maybe Murkowski. But 
for every for every concern that X right wing senator has, there's Mary Landrew, there's Blanche Lambert Lincoln. So this is no joke. I mean, the the Senate leadership and the White House Counsel has to deal with what was less so, but was an extremely diverse caucus of Democrats. The Republican caucus is much less diverse. That's neither a good nor a bad thing. It's just a different operational fact when it comes to judges. But not, certainly not monolithic. I mean, when no, you- I didn't say that. You know, when you- I didn't, I didn't even say if you, monolithic. I even, said it's I less diverse. Yes. It's less ideologically diverse. It is. It's even less when you, ideologically diverse. Okay. But not monolithic. We, we had, had our concerns too. <laughs> Uh, Victor Stone, uh, I hear you arguing about the trees, but no one's talking about the forest. What I hear when I listen to all of you is that all the branch, well, the executive and the, the legislative branch of government are perfectly willing to put up with judicial vacancies and a budget for courthouses and marshals and even salaries that are where they are and that they don't want to move forward. And I say that because the rest of us take the time each year to pay our taxes, and we take the time each month to pay our utility bills, and the federal government, if the strategic oil reserve is down or the power grid is browning out, takes the time to handle that utility because we decide it's a priority. So what I hear you all saying is that the White House doesn't think this is enough of a priority to make sure, to give senators only so much time to nominate and then put it all on to the Senate that they haven't pushed it through, and the Senate doesn't worry about whether it's going to take time for something else and say, well, one day a month we got to do this at least. And so to me the forest is not that the voters don't know or care, but the executive and the legislative branch know and just are perfectly happy uh, to allow the backlog in the courts and think we have enough judges at enough salary and are really not interested in that message of the American Bar Association. I wonder what your response is. Well, I think whether voters care is the function of whether you can package the issue in a way to make them care. So a lot of this is, I mean, I, I, think, I think Robert's actually right. I mean, I think the Republican base actually does care about judges and President Bush whether there's, which way the causal relationship goes, I don't know, but President Bush talked about it a lot and the Republican base cares about it. Um, in terms of the judicial salary issue, I might be wrong, but I, I think I recall that when I was at the Justice Department, we actually supported the judicial salary in, increase, and so it was, it's really a political question because you have members of the American public going, really, they make 175 grand? That's a lot of money, okay, I make 25 grand. So that's the political issue, I think, behind the judicial salary. Of, of all that you said, if I may comment, um, the, the only point with which I would enjoy speaking with you uh, longer is what I heard you to say that the public knows. I, I don't accept that proposition. I don't think the public at large knows um, that they don't appreciate what's at stake. They don't pay attention to the process. Um, when we go out and do public surveys and, and, and a shockingly high percentage of the public, especially the younger public, uh, cannot name a member of the Supreme Court, not even the Chief Justice, but they can name every judge on American Idol. I mean, that's the state of society today. And so I, that's the part of what you said there that, that caused my head to snap back a little bit. And I'd enjoy talking to you about that a little bit longer because I, I don't accept that general proposition. But what's the ABA specifically going to do about that? What is the ABA going to do about it? Well, as I, as I tried to say earlier, we, we are going to continue to invest resources, uh, volunteer time, leadership, reaching out beyond the profession to work with uh, the public at large through outside organizations to communicate, communicate. Several years ago, real quick, in, in Colorado, uh, a ballot proposition was, was, was put to the voters, which when the signatures were submitted and the ballot proposition was, was uh, to go forward, um, the, the ballot proposition proposed uh, that with voter approval, term limits in the judiciary in Colorado would be four years, and each judge would be term limited with one term. So imagine trying to recruit a qualified judiciary to a system set up like that. 
the bar, uh, and I heard this directly from them at the time, um, went to visit from the ABA and talk with them about this. They thought, well, this is preposterous. This is not going to get to first base. And then the polling showed that a high percentage of the public thought this was a wonderful idea. We don't want independent judges. These are political officials. These are government officials. They should be accountable, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the bar then went out and, and undertook an education process, raised the money to have an effective communication program in an approximately six months before the general election when this ballot proposition was voted upon, pretty much reversed the public's view because it went out, spoke everywhere that a forum could be identified and a lawyer could make the time to go and and, and, and explain what was going on here, and, and the ballot proposition was overridingly defeated. Now that example tells me that the public, uh, of course, can be educated, but it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take more effort than just the ABA can deliver. It's going to take our profession and all those interested, like this wonderful society having this program today, to help and work together to get the public awakened to what this crisis really means for them in their everyday lives. Uh, Bill Laurie at the AFL-CIO. This is for Bill primarily. Uh, I was gratified to hear your comments about the uh, state commissions, the vetting commissions that have been set up, particularly the comments uh, where you called upon or the ABA calls upon uh, the senators or whoever establishes these commissions to have people from all walks of life participate. We've had incidents where that wasn't the case and highly qualified or people who we thought were highly qualified nominees were met with less than a friendly uh, uh, audience, if you will. But at the ABA, we were wondering also about your, your standing committee, the, the vetting, uh, your, your vetting committee. Uh, and at least we've heard the concern expressed that that committee does not um, adequately represent all walks of life, that while there may be uh, some diversity of race or gender, that beyond that, it, it, the, the committee itself tends to reflect a more, uh, if you will, establishment background. Uh, and I was wondering if you had given any thought to looking into that or whether you've heard those concerns uh, and whether there's a means for the committee to uh, reach out and broaden its scope. Certainly the ABA has a broad range of, of constituencies from, from which to draw. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thought. Um, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I, I can beg off on the grounds that I'm a rookie, and I'm just uh, getting into the role that I'm that I'm playing as president-elect. And I'm not trying to be evasive. I just don't like to try to give an answer when I don't know what the answer is. But I'd be glad to follow up with you and get get you that information. Uh, our our review is really a peer review. It's not a comprehensive review. It's limited to uh, professional competence, integrity, and judicial temperament. It's not comprehensive. We're not, we're not evaluating a candidate in all aspects that would be the consideration of the Senate in deciding to approve or not approve the appointment of the president. Ours is a very limited scope. So we have historically, having been asked to do this by the Eisenhower administration and then every administration since up to the Bush administration, uh, we have been comfortable giving that limited focused peer review. But, but what you're suggesting certainly is interesting, uh, certainly would be different, but nevertheless could be very valuable. So I, I, I don't know more to say than that. If I could just follow up, the concern is, Bill, that the concern is that some, at least some of the nominees that the president has made from the non-traditional background that Robert mentioned before, public defenders or legal service lawyers or others have received ratings that appear to be lower than folks who come from what others might consider to be the establishment community. So again, I'm not saying that that's so, but maybe it's something that, that you can take a look at. I understand, I certainly respect that concern, but it, but it gives me an opportunity to say that, that since 1960, the presidency of JFK, of course, um, up through the presidency of, of President Bush, the American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary has reviewed approximately 2,000 nominees, 2,000. Of those 2,000, all were rated, all were rated qualified or well qualified, except for just 33. Of those 33, 23 
were nominees of Democratic presidents. Ten were nominees of Republican presidents. So um, I, I don't know how that. What's the utility of the process? I'm sorry? And what's the utility of the process? Then what is the utility of the process? Right. The utility of the process is. If less is than 1% are unqualified, is that? The, well, I'm going to try to answer your question. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the utility of the process is that up to the term, two terms of President Bush and now under President Obama, uh, the committee has been given the privilege, as requested, to vet nominees before they're, before they're nominated. And we have no statistics and no reports. Uh, with regard to those nominees who have been vetted by the committee that never then were nominated because of the evaluation process that took place uh, because of privacy, respect for privacy, respect for candidates, and not wanting to make things public, but reporting back to the White House, and then persons not nominated because for various reasons shouldn't have been. We have no statistics on that. So the value of the process certainly is in, in part related to that. I apologize. I, 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 there was no predicate to my question. Uh, w where I come from is I wish you were much more substantive and engaged and aggressive and involved and transparent. It, you can perform a crucial nonpartisan function for the Senate and the nation. And I'm afraid for political reasons and procedural reasons, you're not permitted to do that. And, and it becomes an a, a kind of a stamp that doesn't have enough of a substantive meaning to the audience that you want it to because they're, because people have no idea what the process is and what the questions are. It's just very, very, very challenging. I worked in Congress for a long time. I handled judicial nominations from the Department of Justice for the Clinton administration. And, you know, regrettably, the, the, the ABA endorsement became a pretextual issue for senators. If, if you had an endorsement, then they would wave it around and be very glad about it. If they didn't get an endorsement or if it was a lesser qualified, then they ignored it. And I want more. I, I'm not sure what I want, but I want more. Well, um, send us a <laughs> suggestion, and we'll take it under serious consideration. We, we do not represent that we provide perfection but we do think that we play a valuable role in the overall process, and we're only part of the process. But we are, believe me, always interested in trying to do better, so please send your, your suggestions our way. We have time for one more question. Sorry, this, this gentleman's been waiting a while. Hi, my, uh, my name is uh, Tom Goldstein. I'm with the law firm Perry, Crumzig and Jack. And so it sounds like, um, just from the panel, you know, the dominant factor of why things, and the, I guess the question is, why have things gotten worse or perceived to have gotten worse over the last 10, 20 years? And it sounds like, the, particularly coming from Rachel and Robert, it, the answer is political factors that, and it sounds like the fact that the Republic, in particular the Republicans in the Senate, well, the Republican base is more fired up about, judici about judges. And so there are far more Republicans worried about primary challenges potentially um, on that issue. And whereas Democrats, even Democratic moderates, don't seem to be particularly concerned about primary challenges from the base. And as a result, and that perhaps, I mean, would you say that in addition to the fact that uh, we have a president who's running in you know under 50% in the polls right now, um, and that we've had throughout Bush's term, he was running for much of it, particularly after the post 9-11 period under 50%, that, you know, that is leads to political gridlock and it's not getting the public more educated. I mean, that seems just seems like a hopeless factor that we'll talk about 10 years from now and 20 years and 30 years and we'll always say we public should be more educated about the importance of judges. And it's a good noble thing to try, but it'll never really change. And the Senate rules are what they are, and they've always been like this, and people aren't necessarily meaner now than they were. It just sounds like that when you have political gridlock, that's sort of the structural factor. And that's sort of what I'm hearing from you, and I just want to get your thoughts on that. Is the question how to get rid of political gridlock? I mean, is, that, is it political gridlock? Is that, I mean, or is it, it sounds like it's largely politics. And when the Republican base cares more, and the Democrat base doesn't care that much, or as much, 
and the Republican senators are thus empowered or feel required to take an obstructionist position. And that, you know, in, in, as well in the Democrats, well, when you have weak presidents, it seems like this is what you wind up with. Thank you, sir. Any answers? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe an unanswerable question. <laughs> I want to thank our panelists very much for taking the time to be here today and sharing their insights into this process and how it's working and not working. Um, and thank you for spending your time with us.